wow, I have this dream that this happens all around the world and there are people who want to help us do it in Stockholm, in New York, in San Francisco, in Australia. So, you know what they tell me in the forest when I start flying like this, I say, calm. Thank you so much, Sarah. Talking about uh, flying really far is Zach Bell. Zach, uh, join me on stage. Zach was here last year, huge supporter of what, me, of whatever you do. Um, and Zach has been uh, helping us with the idea of power, who, should, who we should have uh, since the very beginning. Well, since 20 years ago or something, really. <laughs> and Zach last year presented this uh, idea of a religion of no religion. Uh, and today, he, uh, he offered uh, to uh, tell you, to give you some guidance on all these spiritual tools, right? There is meditation, breath work, and uh, any form of spirituality. You could go with the Kogis and spend 10 years if, if they accept you. Tough. Uh, you can't even visit. <laughs> uh, or you could go, uh, like I did, with Yawanawa or Ashaninka, or you could go uh, with um, Buddhist teachers, the world is, uh, is your oyster, right? It's huge. So, Zach, please give us some guidance on what, what we do. Do we go to church? It's a, a Sunday tomorrow. I think it's up to you. Uh, <laughs> thank you. So, what, what, what Luik didn't say is that last year, it's like, okay, you should come give a talk. And um, we didn't even talk about it. You just put the title of what my talk would be. And I, I basically <laughs> came up. The, a lot of what's happening right now in the last year of my life is your fault. And I'm very grateful. And likewise. Yeah, I feel it's a good, it's a good relationship. Uh, no, it's a great, I love you. It's super fun, I love you too, man. It's been an amazing day. And congratulations on the investment, you absolutely deserve it. Two. Two. We have two I mean, uh, founding happen. investors, I don't know, yeah. we're gonna... Well, I've got some market data for your investors on those slides. Oh, ah, but perfect, can you please tell me what <laughs> yeah. to do now? Yeah, yeah, the, we'll you know, it's yeah. like I did reverse, it's like we have investors that we need to... I remember the last time we were in, uh, doing anything in a conference together, we bought Larry Harvey from Burning Man. Yes, oh, yes, you did. Uh, you did, and uh, we did, Forgot. to uh, his first time in Europe. Was, Le Web London, Yeah. that was pretty... Cool. And, and, uh, and John Perry Barlow, <sighs> who both left us. My first time, my first time yeah, we were sitting, sitting on a stage in, oh, it's crazy. in London with Larry Harvey and John Perry Barlow. And at the time I was asking... Uh, bear, was asking bear in the bear hat. Yeah, I was asking why, why people would even consider doing psychedelics. And yeah. like I was so, anyway. He was like, I hope he doesn't talk about, you're like, I hope he doesn't talk about drugs. <laughs> I know, I look where I am now. <laughs> it's great, I come a long way. This is not a psychedelics conference. It's not, there's a lot it's of those. But it's not a conference either. Yeah. Have you noticed that? Yeah, it's amazing. This is a, a, a kind of, during the night, I kind of, do you want to talk about something? Eventually, <laughs> as long as you don't start that timer, I'm good. Yeah, it's not started. <laughs> the, uh, this is a ceremony. This is a gathering of people who want to help the world, yeah. who are open to receive, because we all know nothing, right? We are understanding that, the understanding that we're all one with each other, with the Kogi, with all our brothers there and sisters. The conversation we've been having for a long time is this intersection of what's happening in the psychedelic world or in the consciousness world, as well, as what's, as, well as what's happening in entrepreneurship and technology, and it's been interrelated for 20, 30 years now. Do you know why? You know, why? Because it's very easy to go meditate or get to the Amazon forest and, and just, I mean, with all respect. I've done, you know, I've tried. But it, it's like, you sit with a tree, beautiful, like, but this is way hard, not power, but whatever you're doing in real life, yeah. right? It's way harder. Way harder. <laughs> it's pretty cool. And it's, it's, cool, it's cool to start bringing it together. I would it's... prefer meditating all day. No, it's actually, yeah, yeah. That's hard too. <laughs> so anyway, so this is, uh, this is the big plan and, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm so happy you're, Part of it, Zach, and maybe I should let you do your talk. If you want, it's your conference. It's your ceremony, it's your ceremony. How's everyone doing? Woo! All right. I'm so, I'm so happy for Luik and for Paula. This is such an amazing um, thing. So I'm gonna talk today about reimagining uh, religion. First, a little bit about myself. My name is Zach Bell. I'm the CEO of a company called My Place. We help you share your house with your friends around the world. If you're not on it, check it out. Um, I also started a project called Return about 15 years ago at the Esalen Institute in Big Sur, where we've been gathering thought leaders to try to figure out what's going on with this weird cultural movement we've all been part of for a long time. And currently I'm starting a new project uh, called Namuna, which you'll hear a lot about today uh, with my girlfriend Elise, um, and we'll share a lot more about that. Question, 
Does everyone recognize these things? Right? Um, there's a, we have a mala bead uh, from the Hindu tradition. We have, the, the second one's weird. It's white sage and also Palo Santo and together. And then we have bells, uh, meditation bells from the East and, and pyramids. Do these seem weird to have together? No, right? That's weird. That's super new. And no one talks about it. These are four, five different traditions from around the world that never talked to each other until recently. That's white sage from a North American tribe and Palo Santo from South American tribes sitting on a dish together and they look like they go together, but they never have until now. And it's super weird. One more question. Has anyone ever said I'm spiritual but not religious? Okay, cool. So uh, everyone. Um, <laughs> But you know how you also kind of think it's just you and your friends and you're alone and it's like the whole world is kind of crazy? Turns out we're the second largest majority of people in the world. I have actually some data on it. So this is really fun. So um, this is people, the top line, this is from 2017, so I'll brush ahead of it a little bit. But that's Christianity in America, the top line. And the bottom line here is people who are spiritual but not religious. Actually today, that top line's up to 40, down to 42% and the bottom line's up to 37%. So 37% of Americans are identifying as spiritual but not religious. We don't have data for the rest of the world because no one cares as much about data as we do. Um, but it's declining at the exact same rate that it's increasing. And the other side is really interesting is it transcends people who are spiritual but not religious, transcends gender, ethnicity, party affiliation, and even goes far into socioeconomic class and location. So it's actually this massive global movement, about 30 to 40% of the world, and increasing rapidly of people who are spiritual but not religious. It's so interesting right now that people are writing books about it. There's Time Magazine articles. This is in 1960 that kicked off the whole movement. Books about it. There's religious papers about it. There's a Wikipedia page about it. There's actually an acronym called SBNR, spiritual but not religious. And I found out about the acronym from this conference. These are all papers from deans and provosts of like liberal arts universities from around the world who were studying this thing called SBNR. And they invited me to come to this conference. They said, come to this SBNR conference. I was like, what's that? I get to, the, I get to this conference. There's all these um, professors. I'm like, what am I doing at this conference? Like, why am I here? And then I realized that they were studying me. They were like, that's one of them. Like, he goes to Burning Man. And I was like, oh, this is so cool. Like, they're actually, this movement that we're part of, these people that are spiritual but not religious, were being studied. Like, in, uni in universities, there's classes on us at this point. They're calling it the fastest growing and only decentralized religious movement in history. And it's happening right now. It's leaderless. There's no central base. And it's absolutely fascinating. So how did we get here? We have over the last 100 years or so, and I'll give a little brief history of the last 100 years, is two worldviews colliding, Eastern philosophy and Western philosophy kind of colliding. Whether or not they want to hide in their own worlds, the internet has made it impossible. It's over. If no matter what you believe in, no matter how far into the jungle you keep your tribe, someone will find you and tell you what else is going on in the world and give you an iPhone. Sorry, we're doing it here, like they're, they're here. We've brought them here out of the, like it, no matter what you believe in, no matter how crazy it is, no matter how hard you try to create your culture and make it insular, you're gonna intersect with every other worldview and you gotta figure out how to bring it together. That's the process. That's the tension that like I feel in the world. Like what is it, what's going on? Is people trying to understand things together? And so here's like a little bit of history. Um, you have Sri Aurobindo in the late 18th century wrote a book called The Life Divine. He, was, he grew up a Brahmin in India and then went to college in King's College of London, wrote The Life Divine and basically brought together the first academic paper on worldly religion. Some of the scholars of today call it global panentheism. Um, I'm gonna skip a lot of things. Like I'm gonna skip Aldous Huxley and the Brave New World, all these things. I'm gonna go right to Stanford in the, actually 1946. Um, there was a professor named Friedrich Spiegelberg. He wrote a paper called The Religion of No Religion, heavily citing the work of Sri Aurobindo. There's a lot of stuff that that professor did, two things that are relevant in our culture today. One, he had a student named Michael Murphy who dropped out of Stanford, dropped out of med school after taking his class, moved to Oroville's ashram in India, lived there for multiple years, came back to California in 1959, and started the Esalen Institute. If you aren't aware of the Esalen Institute, they're the institute in California responsible. If you were going to Pawa now, and you lived back then, you were at Esalen. It, they're responsible for bringing yoga, meditation, West, Eastern philosophy, all that stuff into the mainstream United States culture. The professor also had another interesting friend he called. He called his friend Alan and said, hey, Alan, I think your ideas will be popular over here in California. That guy became Alan Watts. Um, and you know him by first and last name right now. And if the religion of no religion has a leader, it's that guy. And all three of these books are called The Religion of No Religion, 
Um, the Esalen book is America and the Religion of No Religion, and Alan Watts' one of his first books was called Buddhism and the Religion of No Religion. So where are we now? So we're trying to do everything. So I'm trying to follow like this feminine calendar of the cosmos. I'm trying to do a tea ceremony. Then I'm going to do a Mayan clay ceremony. Might be do some yoga, probably transcendental meditation. But before I do breath work, after that, I need to do an ice plunge. If I'm not doing an ice plunge, maybe I should go do a ceremony. But maybe I should go to Burning Man. If I don't go to Burning Man, I should do a sound bath. If, not, if I'm not a sound bath, I want to do a sound healing. Not a sound healing, I should probably do a sound ceremony. Should I do a sound bath ceremony or healing? Maybe it's a Mayan clay ceremony. I'm not quite sure, but maybe I'll do a tennis scale. I should probably go meditate. And like, it's impossible. Like, it's hard enough to be a Buddhist and meditate for 15 minutes, and they tell you exactly what to do. Right? Meanwhile, we're like, okay, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to say I'm spiritual but not religious, so I'm going to get rid of all structure, all community, all, re- all teachings, anything, and then I'm going to open myself up to every practice that's ever been invented ever in the world. I'm just going to figure it out by myself. And so I'm just, I just, I've just been stuck, right? And so what happens is you, you end up with this guy. You ever, anyone know who this guy is? Fa- uh, super famous guy, Jesus. Um, he, was fa- he did one thing he was really well known for, which is washing people's feet. Uh, he did a couple other things, but this thing about washing people's feet, uh, it brings up a story that I love to share. And one is, are, if, you, if you follow Jesus, do you just go washing people's feet? Like, and if you think if you wash people's feet all day, you'll become Jesus? Or are you just kind of doing the actions of an enlightened person hoping to be enlightened? Right? So the question is, why are you doing these things? Why did you go to the sound healing? Are you on a path towards something? Or are you just prostrating the actions of some other enlightened person? So with all these things, we understand why are we doing them and how should we do them so that we don't end up just randomly washing people's feet, but we end up as a result of our enlightenment washing people's feet. Right? So what do we do? So what do we do when we're in a room like this and we're talking about all the conversations right now? Like, I haven't really heard much about this like, whole chat GPT thing. Sounds like it might be popular. Um, and so, so what I did, I, I talked to a really smart friend. I was like, what do I do with the AI? Like, it, it makes no sense for my business. I'm not an artist. Like, what do I do? He was like, ask it the hardest questions you've been struggling with as though you have the smartest friend. So I, I, I've always had this like, theory. I'm actually going to skip this slide and come back to it. And so, so I asked ChatGPT to try to solve this riddle. And so if you've ever famous, there's this famous uh, Hindu parable of the five blind men who touch an elephant, right? If anyone ever heard this one, the one blind man touches the belly, says elephant's like a wall. Someone touches the leg, says elephant's like tree. They touch the tusk and say elephant's like bone, tail, elephant's like a snake, and so on. And the five blind men represent the five major world religions, all touching that thing that they're all trying to describe. And so I was trying to decide, how do I put all these religions together? Like, and so I sat down, opened up my laptop, and said, what are all, what, if you take every spiritual practice, every religion, every group that's ever existed, what do they all do that's the same? And when? And why do they do it? And I had about a 30-day conversation with ChatGPT, trying to distill what's the root of every religion, of every spiritual group, of every practice. And it turns out it's not that complicated. So I ended up coming up with this thing that was really, this is not going to be surprising. It's radically simple. And I'm calling it the eternal calendar, or the invisible ink, which is the through line that connects every spiritual practice, every tribal tradition, every religion that's ever existed in the world. And they all do two things. They basically have a yearly calendar and a lifetime calendar. And the lifetime calendar is what we know as rites of passage. Birth, coming of age, partnership and marriage, elderhood, transition and death. And they almost all have, you know, when you ask what does everyone do, there's some wanky outliers. So you just kind of like let people who do weird stuff go away. But most people from the Egyptians to the Mayans, everyone has a calendar that ostensibly focuses on the movements of the sun and the moon. And they have new moons and full moons, solstices and equinoxes. And, a, and most of the world does a lunar new year. We here in the West are a little weird that we don't do that one. And, and the one thing that's not focused on the movement of the sun and the moon is actually everyone, pretty much everyone does something every week, whether it's a meal, a Shabbat, or a temple. So why is that important and why does that make sense? Because if you try to do stuff on your own and you say I'm spiritual but not religious and you're going to kind of figure it all out on your own, no matter where you end up, no matter what tradition you end up with, no matter who you end up doing it with, you're going to follow this template because no one's ever not followed the template. Almost everyone who's ever tried to formalize how to live a life in some type of reverent capacity does this calendar. 
here's an Egyptian calendar. They had a lunar calendar and a solar calendar. They also had a ritual calendar and a civil calendar that I learned about yesterday. The Mayans had a similar calendar that followed the similar patterns. This is a spiritual calendar the New York Times did an amazing piece on a few weeks ago about this is an early Catholic attempt at merging these solar calendars. And it's been fascinating. And so what guides these calendars and why are they relevant? No matter who you are, no matter what myth you believe in, no matter what spiritual practice you have, coming of age is a thing that needs to have its moment marked, either in personally or in community. And no matter who you are, you'll transition to an elder. No matter who you are, you'll attempt to figure out what it means to merge a partnership in life with somebody. No matter who you are, you've been born. Right? These things happen, and they, these religions are an attempt at explaining them. Similarly, with the guidance of the, the movement of the cosmos, like at the spring equinox, no matter what you believe in, even if you're a scientist, you have a word for it. No one doesn't notice what's happening at these moments. And, and whether you sound not spiritual, but like, yeah, it's spring. You just marked it, right? And so what we can do is if we actually lay out this calendar, we can start to put all of these practices that we're learning in a simple order that always has existed. And so what we've done is created this eternal calendar as a template and are giving it to everyone. So you can find all the people doing full, like what am I supposed to do at the full moon? Is it a sound bath, a ceremony, healing, or a sound wash? I don't know. So like it's the full moon, here's a list of, here's what people do. And here's things that you can do. And the most important part is here's other people doing these things. We're 30, 40% of the world. We should probably start doing things together and not alone. And we shouldn't be making up these practices. They fully exist. Everyone's figured this out before. Like people are like, ah, the Egyptians, they wish they would have told us. They carved it in stone. <laughs> I wish the Mayans told us what they were thinking. It's like the size of this screen chiseled by like a thousand people. Like it's right there. Let's just do it. There's not, we're not going to reinvent anything. There's a great quote that says, no one ever reinvents anything. We just, it's a Joseph Campbell quote. He says, we just update the mythology. So what we're doing is we're updating the mythology. We created a project called Namuna, and we're culti- helping people cultivate spiritual practices and rooted real practices with from the wisdom of all antiquity together or alone, but in a community where it says, here's, how it, here's all the things that are going on. We did our first gathering the other day. Of course, we were hosted by this artist. He does these incredible pieces of art. And we asked people to design their calendar with each other in conversation, in community about these things, regardless of what they believe in or what they wanted to do. And all of the results were different, but they all wanted to do similar things at similar times. And so here's an example. This is a quick story. Is, um, uh, Elise and I were leaving a Vipassana meditation at New Year's, and we had about five days before a wedding. And we had a lot, my fault, we had like a nine hour drive. I was like, we shouldn't fly. And so we're in this car and we're like, let's talk, like, what are we gonna do with this wedding? None of the people who are getting married are, are religious. Their families aren't religious. None of their friends are religious. So what are they gonna do? They're probably gonna hire one of their most spiritual friends to like say some spiritual things. And that's it. Have they thought about partnership? Have they thought, like, are they getting Christian married? Are they getting Jewish married? Are they getting, what are they, they're not gonna do any of that. So we were like, well, what would we throw a party for? So we just started brainstorming and threw out a template of what a rite of passage could be that hits all the things that are hit in a Christian marriage temp contract or a United States marriage contract. And we kind of just took, and we, and we just wrote it down. And so what we started to notice is that all of our friends, we went to the wedding and we said we did this, everyone wanted one. It's like, well, can we just see it? We never really thought about this outside of like our family traditions that none of us believe in. And so we've gone through and started templating and drawing on all the templates that every religion has available and putting them in one place so people could actually access them. And so why is that important? Because what's the biggest thing that's going on right now is the simplest religion in the world isn't a religion, it's Buddhism. They, and they say, you don't, there's no religion, you just practice. And you know how you have in your mind that idea of like the monk meditating a, alone in the woods? Have you ever seen where the monks meditate? They meditate with like 100 other monks. They're never alone in the woods, maybe for a brief period of time. But in order to meditate alone, you need a lot of help. You need someone to cook, you need someone to clean, you need someone to turn the power on, you need a lot of help. And so the, the triple gem of Buddhism is called Buddha Dharma Sangha. And for anyone to have a practice, they need a teacher, a teaching, and a community. And without it, it's impossible to have any type of grounded and rooted practice. Right? And so how do we bring in the practice and the community in a group of people who've said we don't want any prescriptive dogmatic religion? 
because it's impossible to do this alone. You can't access all of the world's information, structure it into a practice, and run your religion by yourself. It doesn't work at all. And if we don't do stuff together, here's the biggest fear, right, is the spiritual connectedness is the most powerful tool humans have. And if these 37% of the world that all are spiritual but not religious, like who here thinks we should cut down the rainforest? Right? We're all values aligned. We all have the same desires and wants. But if we don't come together around our, 37% of the world is values aligned. But if we don't come together and do things together and talk about life's challenging moments together and talk about transition and celebrate the full moon and the new years together in community, we lose our most powerful tool of organizing people. Everything, the pyramids, built by a spiritual community. Everything great, all these incredible churches you see built by phenomenal communities, values aligned and, and, and with each other. And we have big problems to solve right now. The biggest problems the world has ever seen. So what we're hoping to do is just help create an open source template for people to come together in a non-dogmatic, non prescriptive way to say we're all spiritual but not religious. We all believe in a higher power. We all want to come together and solve some of the world's biggest problems. So that's kind of what's progressed since last year when Luik made up the name of my talk for me. This is the journey that you've sent us on. We're calling the project Namuna. If anyone's interested, we're gathering. We have, it's Elise and I and a ton of other people that are trying to help right now. We're gathering resources and people and all the things to make this accessible to a lot of people. Because us here in the room, it's important that we have access to this. But imagine someone goes on one of those Instagram ads and clicks on a ketamine clinic and has a massive psychedelic experience in their home in Kansas. Who are they going to talk to? We need to create resources for people to come together and talk about this stuff and come together. And, and, and it's, I think, the, other, the slide that we didn't get a chance to put in here is that decrease in religion and that increase in spiritual but not religious is the same exact correlation of loneliness. And this is why. So hopefully we can get, th this is the room of people who can start bringing people together because all of your friends when you come back from a conference like this are gonna ask you about it. Where, what should I, book should I read? What retreat should I go to? What medicine, what tribe should I do? And so hopefully we can start answering these questions together. Thank you all so much for listening. Yeah. Hey, um, I, you're not gonna do the same talk again next year, so what are you gonna talk about next year? I don't know, y'all do it with me and tell me. <laughs> Let's all go on a journey this next year and then we'll figure out what this talk is next year. <laughs> it's been a fun year though. No, but let's build this movement, no? It's, it's happening. It's happening. Well, it's fascinating. It's fascinating because I want to bring this up because I think it's really interesting. When you don't need to build an AI company to use AI, this imagine you have the smartest friend that can answer the hardest questions you have. Ask it. And that's where this stuff comes from. It's so funny. It's like, where did you come up with this? It's like, well, I asked the Oracle. And the Oracle helped me figure out what's going on globally. I said, what's that's, the That's what the Kogi Zoo. Yeah, I said, what's the, what's the religion of the internet? What's the world believe in if the world would believe in one thing? And this is what it gave me. Okay. It's super fun. I love it. Yeah. Thank Thanks you, so Zach. Should we have Zach uh, next power again? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs>